Well, praise the Lord. What a Savior. Let's turn to your, in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I have the privilege of preaching to you today the wonderful hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see here in this passage, I believe and, and pray, in how he pleads the merit of his blood that we just sang. Let's look at it, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 24. Beginning in verse 18, the author says, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the word that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What a passage. I'll have to admit, I've been anticipating this passage for maybe over a year. And it's my turn to preach. Here in this passage before us, you know, the author, he's endeavoring to close out his letter in the most effective way he can. He loves these people, and it speaks to God and his love for us. He loves us. And, you know, after he had set before us these, these several of these great exemplars of the faith in chapter 11, you know, chapter 12 has been full of this series of, of exhortations and reminders. And so he's exhorting, he's exhorting, and it's like we're coming to the finish line, and he's coming to the end of this letter and he wants to end with a bang. And you remember earlier in the letter, he spoke of the Lord Jesus in the most exalting way almost any of the scriptures do. He's truly exalting Christ. He's magnifying Christ. He's saying such incredible things about this Jesus, the Son of God who, who upholds the universe by the word of his power the one whom angels worship and obey, right? This one who is, in fact, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This is the, the Jesus he sets forth, and he, he, he even brilliantly lays out that he is the Christ. You know, that's not his last name. That, that is his office. That's who he is. He's the prophet, priest, and king. And we see that he's the greatest of all the prophets, the last and final spokesman for God. He's the greatest of all the kings. He's the eternal king whose scepter will never end, whose reign will never end. And someday he's going to roll this whole thing up like a, an old garment, it says. And he's the greatest and only and true high priest. He is the Christ. And this is how he, he's talking about Jesus. The, this author, he's been working hard to convince the group of, of this small group of probably Hebrew house church, this group of believers, these Jewish believers who have embraced Christ as the Christ, Jesus as the Christ, to keep going. Don't turn back. Persevering faithfulness is a key theme. Keep going. You're to follow Jesus. That's what Christians are. We are Christ followers, and we, we are to follow our forerunner as we've seen. He uses names like that, the forerunner, the pioneer, the champion. We're to follow him, trust him, obey him, love him. And, and he warned them against these things about growing dull in hearing, which I hope no one in this room's doing. Growing dull in hearing. Take heed how you hear, the Lord Jesus told us. And don't drift away from the gospel. This warning against 
not paying closer attention to what you've heard. There are things to be heard. We'll see here in a minute. There are really mighty things to be heard. Don't neglect that. Don't don't neglect such a great salvation. And so after all this this Christ-exalting theology, this Christology, and after all the important warnings, he's now closing with these exhortations. And so now we're, we're here in chapter 12, in verses 18 to 24, and he brings up this great comparison. And he, he, what he does is he's comparing the law and the gospel in a nutshell. It, he's, it's presented in this form of a word picture of these two mountains. You see that? These two mountains. And these two mountains show us the difference between the Old Covenant and in the new covenant. And that's a lot of what he's been trying to do throughout the whole letter. How much su- more superior the new covenant is to the old. So let's, let's consider what he says here. Let's look and consider again this first mountain. You know, in verses 14 to 20, right here, he, he describes this terrifying scene. Really, if you were there, you would not be sitting like you're sitting in this room right now. You would have a whole different attitude. But look, he tries. He's given this scene of God coming down to Mount Sinai. And remember, this is the assembly of Israel that Moses had led out, led out of Egypt. All those miracles, he, they came through the, the waters of the Red Sea that parted for them, and they come and they've journeyed into the wilderness. Now here they are. They're at this great mountain, Mount Sinai. And there are, there are several things he mentions about this mountain, about seven things. And, and I want us to notice it's a very balanced and rhythmic way with this word and, and this, and this, and this, and this. He, he, he wants this to be heard, right? He wrote it to be listened to. But look at, look at one of the first things. He says, you have not come to what may be touched, you cannot touch this. It reminded me of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? Don't lay a human hand on that. And we saw the scene of what happened when a guy did lay his hand on it. It's sort of like that. This Mount Sinai, if you touch it, you will die. Stay back. That's the message. And he says, and a blazing fire, a blazing fire, something that will destroy you if you get too near. The closer you get, the closer and closer you get, the hotter and hotter and hotter you're feeling the heat. And you get too close, you will die. You will be consumed. And doesn't he speak later about God being a consuming fire? The Old Testament speaks of that too. But that's what he says. You've come to a mountain that may not be touched, a blazing fire. It's too hot. It's too powerful. And, he goes on, darkness. I want us to see this is building. We're, we're, we're building. We're ramping up. Darkness. Darkness. You come to something that can't be touched, a blazing fire and darkness. You have no light or clarity. No saving knowledge. It's dark. You know, there's much that's unrevealed and that remains hidden that you don't know. A lot of mystery. Things not made known. There's darkness. This is what you've come to. The veil of darkness was covering their eyes, so to speak. This is how he's describing it. And then next, and to gloom. Man. Gloom. Your joy and your peace. Gone. This is a place of gloom. You hear the phrase doom and gloom? This was the ultimate. Doom and gloom. Darkness, fire, blazing fire, and a tempest. Another thing, and a tempest. This storm, you're in the presence of this terrifying fury and chaos and high winds and uncontrollableness, and you're in this storm. There was a storm that descended upon that mountain. And fury. Now he speaks of something and the sound of a trumpet. This is incredible. 
These were not human trumpets people were hearing. These were angelic. These were trumpets angels blew upon. And a human trumpet can pierce the air, can't it? I mean, it, you hear that thing from miles away. They have battlefield trumpets. They have trumpets blasting in different occasions. But this was and angels blowing trumpets. What was going on? It, the, New Testament tell, or the Old Testament tells us that the trumpets were even getting louder and louder and louder. So it's as though when, when God's holy presence was approaching that mountain, coming down, the trumpet blast got louder and louder and louder, and the people must have been incredibly alarmed. And just, I don't know if their, their minds are about to explode. The blast of the angelic trumpets as God's glory and majesty settled on that mountain, the trumpet blasts. Now, this builds up to the final thing. Do you see the two words? A voice. A voice. When the people heard this voice, they begged that no further message be spoken. This is the voice of God. The very words of God spoken by him right there on that mountain. And they were so loud, majestic, and powerful that the people cried out for it to stop. Stop. Can you imagine it? It's like, please stop speaking or we're going to die. Now you may be wondering, what was he saying? right? What was he saying? Well, the Bible tells us. Deuteronomy 5, 22 tells us that what he was saying was basically the Ten Commandments. He spoke them all to the people. Their, their voice heard. I mean, their, word, their ears heard his voice. Deuteronomy 5, 22 says, these words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain." Out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to them. So, before he gave them the stone tablets, this event happened. From the mountain, the trumpet blast, the, the majestic voice came down and spoke all ten commandments. And the people were crying out, stop. Please stop. We're going to die if we hear any more. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that amazing? And, and so you may be sitting here asking, but you know, isn't, isn't God the same as he's always been? Answer, yes, he is. He is the same. He does not change. Well, next question is, why did he appear in such a terrifying way like this to these poor people? You know, they've just been led out of slavery from Egypt, and here they are in this mountain. Shouldn't they catch a break? You may be thinking that. Man, I've been through so much. Can't I catch a break from God at least? Well, the reason is, it's because of sin. You have the holy God of the universe coming down to be in the presence among a sinful people. And this is how a holy God appears to sinners. It's because of our sin, our sinful nature, that brings out this part of God's holy attributes. He is the most terrifying one in existence, in the universe. There is no one more frightful than a holy God in the presence of a sinner, an unforgiven, unrepentant sinner. So, People who die without a Savior, without their sins purged, without their sins forgiven, without their sins covered. You see, they will all view God like this in the judgment day. They will not be able to bear it. They will cry out for God to stop speaking. Please say no more about my sins. They will cry out, in fact... For that very mountain to fall on them. It will be way better. That will be the desire. The Revelation speaks about that. They'll be crying out that the mountains fall on us. Rather than hear that voice anymore. And they will perish. The people knew they had to stay back. They had to stay away. 
and they could not come near. So what did God do? He appointed a, a mediator. This is how covenants work. He appointed a mediator to come on their behalf. But notice, even, even Moses says here, the mediator. What did he say? I, I tremble with fear. I could, his, his initial reaction was, there's no way I could go up on that mountain. There's no way. But God's also merciful, and he provided a way to where, where Moses had the grace and courage to take steps up that mountain and, and go up and meet with him on their behalf. And what we're seeing here, what we're seeing is in the Old Covenant, God is presented as, as mostly unapproachable. Unapproachable. For example, we, we read earlier in Hebrews, and if you look at the Old Testament, only the priest could go into the tabernacle, right? You can't go in there if you're not a priest. And you had to stay outside the gate, outside the perimeter post, right? Outside the, the fence lines. You had to stay back. And only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, the inner room where the Ark of the Covenant and the Shekinah glory was. He could only go in there once a year. He couldn't just waltz in there anytime he wanted. And when he did go, he better come really prepared in the way God told him to come with the atoning sacrifice and the sprinkled blood and all of that. You see, they had to stay back. Everyone else had to stay outside and wait upon the high priest to come out. Now, I want us to notice something. I, was, I thought of, of the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Galatians, because there's a lot of law and gospel in that letter too, but he made a comment in Galatians 4.21 he said, tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? It's kind of like what the author of Hebrews is doing right here. Are you, are you not listening? You've got the gospel and then you've got this. You're wanting to go back? And then earlier in Galatians, he said, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. He said, it's written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. He goes on to say, now it's evident that no one is justified before God by works of the law. And then he, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, he, he identified this as the ministry of death. Remember? 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 10, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze even at Moses' face when Moses came down. They couldn't even look at his face when he came down with his face shining with that, that glory of, of God upon him. And he says, For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Now, let's look at the contrasting mountain. Mount Zion. I heard if you go to Israel today and you tell a tour guide, hey, take me to Mount Zion. I want to see Mount Zion. I, you're, you may not be too impressed. It's not some big, majestic, rocky huge mountain. In fact, I don't, I don't know if you would even call it much of a mountain at all. Some of you who live near mountains or been in mountains. But it's, it's, a, it's a small mountain, we'll call it that. And it's a place where, as I understand it, that, that the Temple Mount and then the King's House were both. Like there, there were two elevations part of it. The King and the Temple. Think of the picture there. Mount Zion, the King's home. And the true temple. Well, here we, we have a contrast. And we see it right off in verse 22. In verse 22, you have a, you, you have not come language changes to you have come. You have come. This is the experience of, of encountering God through Christ. You have come. You may come. Christ is the way, and he's showing you the way. And his message is always, come, come, come unto me. Come, you may come. You who are thirsty, come, drink freely. You who have no money, come. All of this is it's from the beginning of his ministry 
to Revelation, the very end, one of the last things he says, all may come. So when you hear the gospel to come to Christ, where do we also come to, according to this text, to this Mount Zion? You have come to Mount Zion. Now, John Owen calls this Zion. He said, Zion is the state of believers under the New Testament. It's the state of the believers under the New Testament. You're, you're there if you're a believer. This mountain is, is completely different than Mount Sinai. It's two different mountains. I want us to see that. He didn't rebuild Sinai. It's a totally different mountain, totally different. So this is speaking of Zion, the city of the living God. If you're a Christian, you have citizenship right now in this city. The heavenly Jerusalem, the the true city of peace. Now, we have this mountain picture of, of doom, like this Mount Doom with rocky crags and bolts of lightning and storm and fire and darkness and whirlwind and stay back and and the angels are all guarding it. Like if a beast or anyone touches it, they're going to be loaded down with angelic darts and stoning. You have that, then you have the city picture. Now a city ought to portray something fairly comforting. I know a lot of people like living in the country, but a city gives the portrayal of, of a, a populated place of safety. See, that order ought to be here. And provision and means to get your needs met and protections and things like that. The city, it's very different. And by faith, we, have, we already have a share in this city. That's what the author is trying to argue for them and for us. You already have a share citizenship, privileges of the city, protections and provisions of the city, all of it's yours. And look at what he else, see, he's doing the, he had several things on the, on the mountain of, of Sinai, and he has several things on Mount Zion, too. He said, you've also come to innumerable angels in festal gathering. See, right, they're not blowing their loud trump, trumpet blasts to frighten anyone and have their fiery darts ready and aimed at anyone that gets too close. No, in fact, they're your friends. They're your companions. They're your protectors and defenders. That's what the author said in chapter 2. They're ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. They're they're your avengers, your 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 protectors. They're your best friends. The angels, innumerable, countless angels. If the Lord opened our eyes, perhaps, of the angels in this room, we again wouldn't be able to sit calm and still like this. You can almost just hear their wings fluttering about you. They're angels surrounding us. We're in this city. We're among them. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that a blessing and a comfort and a privilege? So they're your friends. On this mountain, there's no storm and fire and darkness. It's a festival. Festival. People are happy. The gloom is gone. It's festive. There's a festival, and they're dressed for the occasion, dressed for this great joy and the festivities. You know, we like to get dressed up for a joyful occasion, don't we? Humans like that. Even people that dress really casual and like to be casual, at least they'll put on a, a collar. They'll, they'll do something. They'll, There's a dressing for the occasion. It's a joyful thing. It's an honoring thing. And this is how it is. Dress for the occasion. And this, this, what are they, what's the festival about? It it gives this picture of this victory celebration. That our champion, our forerunner, our savior, our Christ, he has accomplished something. He has triumphed. we, We sing this in hymns, victory in Jesus. He's triumphed. It's just, this is what it's all about. It's celebrating him. He's, he's accomplished something no angels could accomplish. He really accomplished something all the history, the long history of priests never did accomplish. With all the blood of the goats and bulls and all, they didn't accomplish anything. Jesus accomplished it all. It's all found in him. It's accomplished in him. 
Look at this. And you have come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. There's an enrollment. The, the, the scriptures speak of a real book. A real book. Would you like to see what's in that book? The Lamb's Book of Life. I tell you what, there's nothing, there's nothing in your life that matters more than your name being found in that book. You, you have come. If you're a believer, here's what you've done. You have come into the assembly, into the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That means you're enrolled now. You are a believer in Christ. You're a member. He tells us, if you embrace Christ by faith, you're a joint heir with him. That's how firstborn son language worked in, in that culture. The firstborn son was, was the privileged one, right? He got the most of the, the inheritance, the double portion. Well, that's you. If you're, if you're in Christ, you're a joint heir, just like him. And he's the ultimate firstborn son of God, isn't he? So you have come. You are adopted and beloved, and you are not only welcome to come into this great city and into this greatest of all families, but you belong there. You may, you'll eventually, I hope, as Christians get this sense, you know, I don't, I don't really belong here. You may already feel that somewhat. I love some aspects and really love some other aspects, but there's a greater reality hanging of, I don't really belong here in this earth. And that's the case. This is why you're a member of this family. You're a citizen of this city. And that's what inspired Abraham, that city whose builder and maker is God. It inspired Moses, and it inspires us, everyone who has the Holy Spirit, that this city is where we want to be, where we have to, we will be able to enjoy this city where God is. And that's what he goes to next. And... You have come. Now, earlier, you have not come. But through the gospel, through Christ, look at the language. And you have come to who? To God. What's the title he's given them here? The judge of all. You've come to, the, to God, the judge of all. And these are, this, he's no longer a frightening judge with a gavel looking at you with a scowl, trying to, about to evaluate every little thing you've done in your life. No, he's your father. He's your father. I mean, he, this, is the, this is the good news. This is the gospel. He's, he's no longer frightening. He's your father. You've come to him now in that way. You've come to the judge, no longer as a judge, but as your loving father. And it keeps going. You have come to the spirits of righteous, the righteous made perfect. Now, these, I believe, are all the faithful who have gone before us. Their souls, they are made perfect. You're not yet perfect in one sense. You still have some growing, maturing, sanctification to, to go through, right? But you've come to them. How does that work? These people who've gone before us who are already in heaven. You know, a lot of the church... The church universal, a lot of it, perhaps at this point, the majority of it, is in heaven. That's called the church triumphant, right? We're called, we're still in the earth, we're still in the race, he mentioned in chapter 12. We're still in the battles, in the fight of faith. We're, we're the church militant. But there's somehow, there's a, you have come to them. You have come to them. Like they're, they're, they're the ones who are in chapter 11. The cloud of witnesses, like or chapter 12, cheering you on. They love you. You're connected with them in some mystical way through Christ. There's a union with them, with this city, with the angels. There's all this union found in Christ. And they want you to make it. And in the gospel, this is incredible. Like That's a lot of what Paul was saying in Ephesians 1. This, this Christ, he says... God make, making known to us the mystery of His will. All right? Some of that darkness is dissipating. He's making known mysteries, uh, revealing things never seen or understood. According to God's purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. To do what? Unite 
all things in him, in Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. This is what the author of the Hebrews is talking about. This is, there's this union with them. Now consider this. I love this. Our desire in the gospel and in the new covenant is not that God will stop speaking, right? Stop, stop it, please, I'll die, stop speaking. No, it's the opposite. We want to hear more, right? Keep speaking, Lord. Speak again. I want to see all you have to say. Speak on. Speak on. It's, I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. I'm going to be encouraged. I'm going to be built up. I'm going to be helped. This is the gospel truth. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. This is the, this is the gospel. His word, this voice, became flesh and dwelt among us. His word became no longer the way of death, the ministry of death, but the way of life. See that? His word became the bread of life for us. And the heart of the Christian says, keep speaking, Lord. I want to hear more. I want to wake up in the morning. I want to hear more. Just, just something, a little thing it could be. Or, or many pages. I just want to hear your voice. You see that? What a contrast. And that brings us now to this precious verse 24. Again, it's building up. And the climactic moment right here is, and you have come to Jesus. Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So as the, that previous mountain experience built up to the dreaded and unbearable holy voice, now we come to Jesus, who was the Word made flesh, who people flocked to to hear His voice. The Sermon on the Mount, where He's given life and He's given food. This is the contrast. He said in chapter 1, in these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son. And this is what we're getting. But have you ever considered that a great deal of what our Lord says is communicated through the message of His blood? This sprinkled blood. Do you know that the blood speaks? The blood has a voice. The blood of Christ speaks. And there's a message in the blood. In a way, this is what all of Hebrews is about. The blood of Jesus speaks. This is the, this is the culmination of the whole letter. It's what he's been trying to get across. It's all about his redemptive sacrifice. And notice, the author compares the sprinkled blood of Jesus with the blood of Abel. Now that's interesting what are we to get out of that? The blood of Abel. Now remember, Abel was the second son of Adam, the very first man, right? His older brother Cain had killed him, slain him. Apparently it was in such a, of a, such a nature that he was bleeding and he bled all over the ground. He had been killed. Well, what would the blood of Abel say? It would say something like, I've been murdered by my brother, right? Lord, justice, justice demands you act. You hate sin. You hate murder. I have been wronged in the worst of ways. I've been faithful in my offerings to you. And now I've suffered a wrongful death. So under the hands of my own brother of all people. See, he should have been... My brother should have been my keeper. And that, wasn't that Cain's attitude when God questioned him? One of the first things he says, where's your brother? What did he say? Am I my brother's keeper? You should have been, yes. By him, I was, I was murdered. And the wages of sin is death. The law demands death. 
and your awful countenance. And that's why we see in Genesis 4, God said to Cain, Cain, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. What's the result? You are now under a curse. And you are going to be a vagabond. No longer a, a dwelling in the safety of a city in peace. No, you're a vagabond. This is the result. So listen now. Listen to the good news of the blood of Christ. There's a contrast. It speaks a better word than that of Abel. See that? A nobler word or better things. What makes it better? His blood delivers us from the terrors and the curse of the law. All that mountain scene, his blood says, I will deliver you from all of it. Right? His blood the, is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. And as the mediator of the new covenant, our Lord Jesus is speaking, I believe, first to God. To God. That's what the high priest does. He's the go-between between man and God. He's man's spokesman to God. A prophet is God's spokesman to man. He's, the, he's in his priestly role shedding his own blood, not that of some lambs and goats. He sheds his own blood. So he is, he is now speaking as our mediator and high priest to God. He's saying something to God. And what's he saying? He's saying, it's finished. Remember that on the cross? It is finished. The covenant sealed. That agreement we made. That agreement wasn't like the Old Testament where God says, you do this, 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 and 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 this. That was ten things. You'll live. You people. I'll let Moses tell you about them after I voice it from the mountain. But the mediator of the new covenant is different. He doesn't go to the people and make some agreement. He goes to Jesus. He goes to the mediator. Son, the, me the agreement's between us. You do this and this and this. And they'll live. But it's going to require something. And Jesus fully, willingly, lovingly came. And so he's saying, one thing his blood is saying is it is finished. This covenant is sealed and ratified forever. It's established in my blood. And he's saying, Father, I have lived a holy life on their behalf. I have satisfied the justice against your holy wrath, against their sins. That's what his blood says to God. He says, Father, let my blood speak to you. Forgive them. Remove the curse. Be reconciled and love them, even with the love with which you love me. That's what the blood says to the Father. Father, give them all joy and peace in believing. Father, keep and protect all who draw near to you through me. This is the message of the blood of the Son of God to his Father. He's our high priest, and his blood accomplished it all. His perfect, sinless blood. He accomplished all with those things, those goats and lambs and sacrifice, atonement, calf, all that symbolized and shadowed. He is the substance. Well, Jesus also speaks to us, doesn't he? He speaks to us through his blood. That's what this text is telling us. He's the God-man, and his blood speaks to both God and man. He's the one who reconciles God and man. So this, God, this blood is speaking to us. So I have to ask you not today, do you hear the message of his blood? Do you hear it? Do you hear the blood's message to you? Do you hear it saying, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come unto you, to me, all you who are under the burden of sin, and I'll set you free. See? Whoever believes in me will not perish. That's what the blood says. But will have eternal life. I've perished in your place. That's what the blood says. 
The blood has been shed, so yours doesn't have to be shed. I've paid the penalty for all your sins. They've all been nailed to my cross, Colossians 2, 14. The record of debt against you. The blood says it's gone. It's paid for. My blood washes away all sins, from the smallest sin to the biggest, the little, the little blemish to the most filthy, horrifying, unthinkable sin and thing you have done and committed. It washes it all away. You're clean in the sight of God. That's what the blood says. See, my blood will cleanse your conscience. You got a guilty conscience? Is it your conscience bothering you? Silence it with the blood the message of the blood of Christ can be silenced in the best way, the right way. The blood says every blessing in the heavenly places is all yours. See, the message is not stay away from the unapproachable God. It, it says, come to me. I will save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through me. So if, if you have sinned or if you're discouraged today, the message to you today is consider again, listen again to the message of the blood. You cannot find encouragement anywhere else, not real encouragement, real help. You've got to first go to the blood that's speaking to you. If you need mercy, if you've sinned, listen to the blood. Right? If, you, if you need abiding hope, if you feel hopeless today, the blood of Christ has a word for you. Let it speak to you. Hear it. If you can't get victory over sin, or over the sins that so easily beset you, the way to get victory is listen to the message of the blood. If you're scared, or worried, or anxious, or heavily concerned about something, the first thing you need to do is listen to the message of the blood. It's all in the blood. It can all be found there. Do you want real happiness, real purpose? Listen to the blood. Don't listen to the devil and his lies. Don't listen to that. In fact, the message of the blood is one thing he cannot counter-argue against. It's the one thing that can silence him forever. It's the message of the blood. The cross of Christ will silence him so don't listen to that. Don't turn back to some lame, useless religion or worldliness. The blood beckons you on. Come on. It beckons you on. Don't give in to the bondage of sin. You do not have to be bound to sin, whatever it is that may have you. The message of the blood is what will liberate you and empowers you to break free from it. And you may be thinking, but all I hear is the thunder and the lightning bolts. All I see is the darkness. All I feel is the storm and gloom and dread for my sins. What's the answer? The blood of Christ speaks a nobler word, a better word. Listen to the message of the blood. This is the answer. Are you struggling with assurance? Many Christians struggle with assurance. I thought I was a Christian, but maybe I'm not. I don't know. Maybe I, I, I'm just not. Or maybe I am. You, you, you grapple with these things. Well, the one thing you don't want to listen to is your own inward reflections. Start listening to yourself, arguing yourself out of this or whatever. You start thinking, of, I've done this too bad, I've done that, or I haven't done this as well as them. You start doing all these comparisons, listening to these other voices. The only way you'll truly first and foremost find assurance comes in the message of the blood. It's got to be a blood-soaked message to you. You start looking away from that stuff, and you start looking and listening to the blood speaking to you, you're going to find your assurance welling up and peace and joy because of what he's done. Don't, don't listen to your self-condemnation. Don't even listen to your own best efforts. Some people talk to themselves like, oh, I did pretty good today, or I'm, I'm on the right track. Hey, I did great. I did good here. Did that. I did. I did. I did. Look what I did. Look at me. 
You start listening to that stuff, you're going you're gonna to crash. No. Don't listen, listen to your best effort, your good works. Don't listen to your own blood. Right? That that's, can almost go into another sermon. But Paul said, if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, I'm nothing. Don't listen to that. It's, it's, it's listen to the message of Christ. So unlike Abel's big brother who killed him, this is another big brother. This is another big brother, unlike Abel, who says, I will bleed for you. I will die for you. I have died for you. Yes, I am your keeper. I am your keeper forever. It's me, and I will be faithful in it. That's what the message of the blood says. And God's not coming to you saying, hey, your, your sins and your brother's blood's all crying out to me from the ground. No, he's saying, my son's blood is crying out to you from the cross. You're forgiven. It speaks a better word. Do you hear it? That's the message. It's not condemnation. It's forgiveness. Forgive them. Take them. Make them your own. Cleanse them. All that they've done. It doesn't matter. Cleanse them all. And this, by the way, might have been something those early Pharisees and religious leaders had to hear. Because when they're, it's dawning on them, oh my, we've done the same thing Cain did to Abel. They needed to hear there's a better word than the blood of Abel. It's not condemnation. It's forgiveness. It's life. You can be washed. Just bow the knee. Just bow the knee to Christ. Acknowledge Him as your Savior. And you're in. You're as clean, whiter than any driven snow, right? We sing those hymns. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, those, those of you maybe who have never believed or put your trust in Christ, this is good news to you today. This is good news. Are you hearing the message of the blood? That's the question. If you've not been baptized or have come, if you've not wanted to believe, listen again. Ask God to give you ears. Lord, let me hear the message of the blood and believe it. This is for you. You can either hear it and believe or you can go on. You can disregard it as worthless. And that will be your, your single biggest mistake of your life. That will lead to your eternal ruin. The blood speaks of God's love. That's the first thing it says. Love. The love of God. If you don't hear that message in the blood, you need to listen again. The love of God. Mercy. Forgiveness. Acceptance. Adoption, security, heaven. That's the message of the blood. You have come to Jesus, and his blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Christians, you press on in faith. Never stop listening to the blood of our Savior. Amen. Father, take this word and do what only you can do. We thank you right now and rejoice in the message of the blood of our Savior. As our Apostle Paul said, I desire to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Bless us with this truth today. Build us up. Build this church upon the message of the blood. It's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen.